Okay, hey, I'm Alex, and uh, I've been having a really fun time this weekend, finally cracking into my sorcery Kickstarter stuff. I, um, I've been building decks and uh, playing them on Tabletop Simulator, and um, you know, bought things to sort my cards into, and uh, you know, cracking boosters. So I'm uh, getting started on my second box. Actually, yeah, uh, I guess I... Uh, <laughs> um, filled up all the memory on my uh, computer making videos, um, so cleared up some memory space. Uh, so what you can see is that we're uh, into the first pack, this is from the left column, and uh, that's where my computer gave me an error message, so uh, here we go. Um, Nessignath Gnomes, it's uh, one mana for one power, has burrowing, and uh, at the end of your turn, uh, they may burrow. So, I think that, uh, you know, burrowing takes a lot of time uh, to use, and it seems really fiddly. Um, you know, I like that you can summon things that are burrowed and that are protected from being targeted by spells so that they can do something afterward. Um, but the, the time taken to, like, burrow back down seems really expensive. Um, so I'm, I'm interested that, you know, this card kind of makes burrowing more efficient. And, um, when I think about trying to make buried treasure work, um, you know, this is the kind of card where, you know, maybe you can like walk over to the buried treasure and then, you know, auto dig itself down and then can like pop back up and maybe the extra action economy makes it, you know, worth it. It's probably still better in a limited setting than a constructed setting, but um, you know this is kind of a card to keep keep my mind on as I see more cards. Like there might be cool synergies that uh, this makes work. Uh, Awakened money mummies, uh, one mana for three power, so very efficient. Um, you summon it, uh, burrowed safely. Um, so even though it doesn't have burrow on the card, which means that it can't optionally burrow back down. Um, these don't die from being burrowed without the burrow ability, uh, at least the first time. And then when an enemy unit moves onto the ground above them, they unburrow and intercept. So, um, you know, these guys are basically like a trap laying beneath the ground, which I think is like wonderful theming, love the art for it. And, um, you know, obviously like your opponent probably isn't going to walk over this space unless they have to. Um, so I think it's probably best combined with, um, oh man, um, I think maybe like Harpooners or something that like pulls the enemy in. Um, I'm trying to think about like what other things move your opponent, like my mind goes to Riptide, but I think Riptide only moves things towards water spaces and obviously you can't be burrowed in a water space. Um, I think that this card is um, kind of hard to use and when I see low power or low mana cost and high power, I think aggressive, and this card feels more reactive. So it might be the sort of thing where if there's like a very aggressive meta game, this is a good defensive card. Um, you know, maybe in limited, the efficiency is just worthwhile, or maybe there's more cards that get made later that have forced movement. Um, most of the ones that exist right now, I really think it heavily involve water. And so that's kind of a nonbo with this um, burrow thing. <clears throat> so interesting card. Um, you know, like I want to aggressively collect it right now. Uh, Whirling Blades. Uh, this is a card that is kind of growing in my estimation. Um, you know, I think that area damage effects are very good for um, you know crowd control. Um, you know, this kind of effect where it strikes everything uh, in a bunch of sites uh, is a way of like pushing the image to avatars, even if they have other things defending them. And um, the extra movement can make surprise attacks happen. Uh, so I like this card. Um, I've been experimenting with it in a sort of meta lane based deck and um, been pretty pleased with it. So. Um, I, don't know. I think when I playtested it before, it never really caught my eye, but I've been playing with it a lot more. Uh, the Elite for this pack is uh, Nightmare, which uh, we've opened before and talked about. So 
um, I think in an effort to not have all my videos be one hour long, I think that I will uh, just skip to the next pack. All right, so pack two from the first column. What did we win? <clears throat> all right, a uh, bunch of sites. Uh, most of them I've seen before, but uh, Free City I'll talk about because I don't think we've talked about it before. Um, so this is a site. It doesn't produce any threshold, but it still produces mana, so it's colorless. And then it has three power and has the ability to attack or defend against enemy units here. Um, so my understanding, it could be wrong, is if it loses combat, uh, it is, is, does it go to the discard? Because if it does, if your opponent puts a bigger creature than three power on here, or, like it could fight it, and like the creature would be, I think, also be discarded when the free city is gone. Maybe I have the rules wrong, not 100% sure, but that's like an interesting thing to me. Um, but it's also, you know, like very defensive. There's a lot of one and two power creatures that people play for a variety of reasons, and the free city can be um, like kind of a, a good defensive site for, um, you know, more controlling deck. Um, and even if you are in a kind of more aggressive deck mirror, um, the fact that you could uh, like have a site that your opponent's creatures can't move on to might make it so that they have more trouble, um, you know, attacking your life total. So uh, I think this card is pretty interesting, and um, I would consider playing it in decks um, pretty strongly. Um, all right, the elite for this pack is Devil's Egg, uh, three mana, and then at the end of each turn, the controller of Devil's Egg's site loses one life. Um, so the strategy is pretty commonly to. Uh, move some kind of creature with the devil's egg and either keep it burrowed or, um, you know, just uh, like carry it around to deal extra damage. Uh, for me, uh, one damage a turn for three mana feels like a pretty bad rate. Um, what I really want is, you know, at worst, getting a three power creature for three mana, or maybe even like a four or five power creature for three mana, so that it can do a lot more damage. Uh, that said, uh, creatures are very easy to kill. Um, Devil's Egg is a little hard to destroy. So um, maybe if it's like a very removal heavy meta game, but none of the removal you know, destroys artifacts, uh, this could be okay. Uh, but even I think like burn spells are just better. Yeah, I have, I have trouble seeing this card. I kept trying to put it into decks and it just never worked out for me. So um, maybe someone else will figure something else out, but um, this is, this is I'm not a fan. Uh, I think thumbs down on Devil's Egg. Um, and then uh, there's a Sorcerer at the back of this pack, which, um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty, but um, you know, I guess everyone has a foil sorcerer, so a little less exciting than getting an avatar might be otherwise. All right, moving on to the next pack. Okay, uh, dodge rule. I'm not sure if we talked about this card, but I'll talk about it again. Um, this is the only kind of reaction spell that's currently in the set. Uh, right, zero mana, you can cast during your opponent's turn, um, you know, two water threshold, so it's a pretty strong, like, water-associated card, but um, when something is, when an ally is attacked, they can move to another adjacent location to evade the attack. Um, you know, attack is pretty limited wording, so it doesn't come up that often. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the time at Death's Door, you're getting hit by spells as often as you're getting hit by attacks. Uh, that said, you know, combat happens in this game, and you can really throw somebody's plans off by dodging. And uh, if their plan is to finish off your avatar with combat, uh, 
dot journal can be infuriating um, when someone has multiple copies of it. So I think it's a pretty good card, and I think it's like a reason to think about playing water. And um, you know, I think it kind of depends what the metagame ultimately is, but um, you know, in this game, larger creatures can very easily dominate smaller creatures, and if you have a smaller creature with a cool utility power, and it, it just needs to live one turn before it does something cool, uh, I think this card's great. So, um, you know, I think that this card is, uh, has a lot of potential in the right circumstances and is, you know, worth thinking about in deck building. Um, Stormy Seas. So this is a uh, Submerge All Minions and Artifacts, Occupying Target Water Site. Yeah, shoot. Um, yeah, I just have a camera precariously perched on a cardboard box, so um, got to be careful. So I think that this is um, you know, kind of like a premium water removal spell. Uh, it only hits one site, but it hits everything on the site, and um, you know, it's the kind of thing that in this game can really punish trying to put too much in a single location. So, um, you know, whenever you're playing against a water player, you're always like trying to play around this card and other ones like it. And, um, you know, I would be pretty surprised if water players don't have, you know, one or more copies and really three copies if they're like a very controlling water deck. Um, yeah, I think this is just like a great card and I would collect the hell out of it if I were a collector, but, um, okay. Next is Gyre Hippogriffs, four mana for three power. Now, this card's kind of interesting. Um, both Airborne and Charge are creature abilities or minion abilities where if it has it, it usually costs a full mana. So four mana for three power Airborne or four mana for a three power Charger are both things that I would expect to see. So this card is, um, you know, efficiently costed, technically speaking, and um, I think that, you know, Airborne is kind of a defensive ability in that bigger ground creatures can't always pick them off, so unless it's getting killed by a spell, uh, this creature really gets to kind of, like, pick the combats at once, and the fact that, you know, it has charge means that it can either deal damage to an avatar or a site or pick off a creature. Um, and Airborne and Charger are actually kind of cool together also because Airborne lets you move diagonally, so this can have unexpected reach from whatever site you're summoning it from. Um, I don't, I'm not saying, like, I love this creature, like, I don't like three power, like, if this were, like, five mana for four power with Airborne and Charge, I'd probably be really excited about it, because then it could be, like, Lightning Bolted or Minor Explosioned. Um, and then, you know, I think like a bunch of the three power creatures that exist, like it could pick off at whim. But um, I think that this is solid. Um, certainly in limited uh, would probably be uh, something I'd look at, you know, not like a top three or four picks in a pack, but it could be like a very high pick. And um, I think, you know, it's, just, it's like solid and... Uh, I think in a, I guess it would probably be an aggressive air deck where, um, you know, maybe I was playing a bunch of like fireballs and lightning bolts and then because this creature has charge, I'd feel comfortable playing it because if I top deck it, it does get three damage. Like it's not just like a dead creature where like, you know, if my opponent just has creature removal that wasn't doing much against my fireballs and lightning bolts. Um, so that's kind of like the place I'm most likely to put it. It also could be like high on the curve on a, an aggressive deck full of creatures, so I think, I think there are like real pl like places where this could be a role player. Um, Candle Miss Monks, three mana, two power. Its uh, death right is uh, proceed to the end phase. So if it dies, the turn ends. Um, I haven't really thought of any ways that this would be good on your own turn, though maybe if you have like a Yggdrasil, which is like a land that when it is destroyed, you destroy everything, um, maybe if you, like, as the player who triggers it, 
you get to choose the order of the triggers. So I think that you could maybe have a one-sided Yggdrasil like sweep or um, maybe there's other kinds of things that are like symmetrical but you get to choose the order and this ends processing it so you can like punish your opponent with all the like bad things but then just like sacrifice this guy and protect all your stuff. Not 100% sure that's the way the rules are currently working but I think it is. So um, that's interesting. I feel like um, as a kind of like defensive card, you could also have this be kind of like protecting your avatar or something, and even if your opponent has multiple creatures that could like get there and attack your avatar, because you block with this one first, it dies, and then like you end your opponent's turn prematurely. Um, there's probably like a lot of setups like that. Um, it could be an interesting combo with, um, I think it's called like Old Oak or Blasted Oak or something, but Blasted Oak requires, if possible, targeting like the Blasted Oak or its site or things in its site, over, like preferentially over other things. And so if you have a Candlemas Monks like standing next to the Oak, um, if your opponent is trying to like cast any burn spells or, you know, removal spells, they're going to have to like do something that kills your monks and end their turn. Um, maybe that's overkill, maybe the Blasted Oak was already doing its job, but um, yeah, this is like, th th this card's kind of like a puzzle box and I think there's like a lot of interesting possibilities and certainly I imagine as more cards get printed there'll be more interesting things to do with this card. Um, so even if it's not great now, it's the kind of card that I would like collect it and when it's good with something else, um, you know, uh, pull it pull it out of your your binder and cash in. Um, all right, do we have any ordinary cards that we haven't seen yet? <clears throat> nope. So, um, moving on to the next pack. Let's all straighten it out so it's prettier. Alright, uh, I think we've seen all of these exceptionals, and the Elite is a uh, Wicked Witch wh that we've seen before, but um, I spent more time staring at it, so you know, I have a few more thoughts about this card. Uh, primarily that, um, even though it only has 2 power for 4 mana, other minions near it are also like downsized, so this is functionally on the, you know, floor power for four mana curve. It's not as good for, um, you know, damaging an avatar, but in terms of minion versus minion conflict, um, this is a great size. Uh, and um, I think that um, there's, you know, in, in a lot of cases, reducing other minions to zero power can... Or, or one power can expose them to other removal effects more easily or just make them really easy to destroy in combat. So uh, I think this is interesting. And it's also a spellcaster, which um, if I recall correctly, I don't think Earth has a ton of things that care about, you know, a spellcaster as a locus, but, um, you know, who knows over time there might be, you know, more things in Earth. And obviously if you're playing with, uh, another element, you know, the, the spellcaster part can be relevant. Um, I think that in limited, this is more likely to be bombing. Like, I'm guessing, based on rarity, there are a lot more just two power creatures, and turning a thing from a two to a zero is phenomenal. Um, mm -mm -mm. Alright, so we got a foil on this pack. It's a host eagle. And, um, yeah, I think that this is a card that might be constructed worthy. I think that, um, three mana for three power, like I said, is not my favorite. I think it's not a bad rate. And, um, you know, there are, like, interesting combo-y things that you can do when moving other minions around. Um, 
like they're just a bunch of like weird water creatures that do things in a space that are miserable for your opponent. Um, maybe even like gargoyles or basilisks have less than three power. I'm not sure if they turn the eagle into stone, so that might not be a good fit. Um, but like, I don't know, there's also like the amoeba, which every space it moves into just gives it plus one power and it, you know, it occupies more spaces. So if, if at the very beginning of summoning an amoeba, you know, this eagle carried it through you know, space, makes it get a little bigger. Um, anyway. I think uh, it's a card that maybe could see play, so, you know, as a foil, it's a little more useful than just, um, you know, the, the bargain bin. All right, uh, let's see. Next pack. Okay, I don't think we've talked about this card yet. Fade Changeling. Um, so, three mana for one power. You can summon it anywhere, and when you do, you can return a minion here to his owner's hand. So you can do it on your own minions or your opponent's minions. Um, as a tempo card, like, casting this for, you know, th three's not a huge price and bouncing more expensive cards that your opponent is playing um, can be a very profitable and effective way of messing up your opponent's plans, particularly if they're playing a lot of expensive cards. Um, you can also, they might have a, a defender in place, uh, and you can bounce that and get in some damage. So, like, that, that, that part can just be uh, frustrating for your opponent, and this is like a classically powerful tempo card. You know, it, like this exists in Magic and gets played both in Constructed and in Limited. And then um, there's the, the whole combo-y part with your own cards. Like if you have a powerful Genesis effect, you can you know, play this, take your creature back up in your hand, play it again. Or um, if, I'm trying to think if there's like, if there's anything, ever anything like, um, you know, like a chain, sha the, the, the shackles or chains, like they equip to a creature and it's disabled. Um, I'm not sure if that, you know, there's a more efficient way of removing them, but like, you know, bouncing your creature back um, or some kind of aura that is trapping it. Um, yeah, so I, I think like very high utility, like very versatile, um, could certainly see play and constructed, and um, you know, it's probably a very sweet thing to draft in limited. I uh, got okay, so I got another aqueduct, and I'm feeling optimistic that I will have a, a full set of uh, duels by the time I finish uh, the second box. And then uh, the elite is the phoenix, which we've we've talked about before. Um, so you know, fine, but not the most most exciting to me. Ooh, all right. We got a, a foil windmill, and um, I was playing on tabletop simulator, and someone asked me if I uh, was likely to try and foil out my decks. And I think the answer is yes. You know, I think foiling an alpha is probably not something I'll succeed at. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of the alpha cards, there just aren't that many of, and they're, you know, more expensive than I, I think I want my, my hobby decks to be. But um, I think just, like, generally, if Eric's Curiosa keeps up with, like, the foils just being beautiful, you know, I'll pick up like beta or other edition foils and and foil my deck so they're they're pretty. Uh, okay, so let me get these out of the way and the rest of this pack. It's all commons we've seen, so I'll move on to the next pack.
Okay, uh, Guile Sirens are um, maybe a perfect example of a water card that does weird things um, to other creatures. So three mana, uh, three power, Submerge. At the start of your turn, force target nearby enemy minion to take a step toward Guile Sirens. So um, I'm a big fan of this card. I think that... Um, you know, minions going to the wrong places is great uh, if it's not your minion. And, um, you know, I think that there are, uh, you know, possibilities like um, giving this flying or airborne and putting it in a chasm so that you know, they, they lure things to their doom. Um, you know, this can be combined with things like a shark or a anglerfish um, to you know, make something move within the water, and then you know, it gets like auto attacked. Um, or just like if you um, you know flood your opponent's um, space, you can just force minions to leave your territory and, you know, stop draining life from your avatar. Um, you know, I think there are, there are a lot of, like, flexible, clever things to do. And, um, you know, the fact that these are submerged can make it so that they can't be targeted. Um, and so, like, they have a, like, persistent effect that, um, you know, helps you and is, is hard for your opponent to stop. So, uh, love this card. Happy to collect it. Um, and then, I don't think we've seen this card before either. It's a Wind Blast. So it's uh, two mana, air. Push everything atop sites one step in a cardinal direction. So you get to choose, move everything away from you, toward you, left or right. Um, I have played with this card before. Um, like in a constructed deck. I don't remember why I was trying to move everything to a specific edge. Um, I think that um, maybe one of the modes I was thinking about was just getting a little extra movement to help my creatures like charge towards uh, the other player's side to hit their sights. Um, this is kind of, I mean, that's kind of interesting if you're playing some kind of horde strategy, like, you know, a bunch of gray wolves, or you had a bunch of earth creatures that had synergies with each other, um, but you didn't want to stack them all in the same space because you didn't want to be vulnerable to a, like, targeted site removal spell. This is kind of an interesting way to, like, move all of your guys at once. Alternatively, if you're playing a water deck and, you know, you've succeeded in kind of like making two rows on your side water and having like flooding effects, getting into the third row, but the, you know, the back row your opponent has mostly filled up with, you know, bedrocks or something, or just, you know, you, you don't have flooding cards to get back there. Maybe like Wind Blast is an interesting way to like pull things out into the water. Um, so I think this is like an interesting role player. The fact that it just moves so many things, you know, feels like it does something. Um, you know, and it's inexpensive. Um, obviously, like, paying a whole card for it can feel costly, but, um, I don't know, like, force movement is in my experience, been pretty good in this game, and mass force movement has to be good in the right situation. Um, we got our elite, and this is a Angel's Egg, which um, I've talked about before. And, um, yeah, no foil, so on to the next pack. Backstab, I don't think we've seen this one yet. 
So, uh, two mana. Uh, target minion moves to an adjacent location if needed to strike another target tapped minion there. So, you can choose someone else's minions. So you can have them, you know, one minion kill another minion that they control. Uh, I guess the dream is that... Um, uh, I, I guess it, it doesn't attack back because it says strike. Uh, the tough thing is that it only targets tapped minions, so, um, you know, you, you don't get, like, the awesome, like, oh, your, your thing that you're putting and defending with and removing it. Um, you can also target your own minion, um, which is cool. Like, I love things that move one of your guys and strike, and this has no movement limitation, so... It can move like very far across the board, um, but the main problem is like it can only target tapped minions. Um, minions do tap, so it's you know it's a thing that happens. So this could create some pretty surprising, you know, my huge creature that I just summon, I teleport all the way across the board, or this huge creature that I summon last turn teleports across the board, kills this thing, and then also attacks something else. Um, I think as far as if you're in like a mono fire deck and you're pretty sure your opponents play minions, it can have some use. Um, I think that I really just worry that um, there's some players that don't play a lot of minions and um, you know this card could be like stranded in your hand. Um, so I think it's interesting, and you know, in, in limited probably it's targeted removal, and targeted removal is you know, usually good in magic, and I imagine it's good in limited sorcery too. Um, and that limited games, there's going to be a lot more minions. So I think it's like an interesting card, um, but I think also very situational. Uh, Thunderstorm, um, I, this card's great, um, you know, four mana, aura covers some spaces, um, you're allowed to put it on, I think you have to put it on four spaces, unless it says otherwise, so, um, you know, it's, it's at its best when you're culling your opponent's creatures so that this is hitting what you want, um, you know, it, it gets to move, so if they run away from it, you can chase it. Um, my understanding is that the text of this card is going to change um, from after it deals damage three times, dispel it, to, like, after three turns, dispel it. So, um, I, don't, I don't know if that's true, that's just what I heard, but um, I guess maybe uh, enjoy the high power level of Thunderstorm while it lasts. And um, it's probably still a powerful card even when the text depowers it. Um, Wings of Invention. This is um, two mana. Uh, Bear has airborne and movement plus one if it's a minion. I think um, all my fantasies about dragging minions over bottomless pits. Wings of Invention is the enabler for. Uh, I think in general getting plus one movement can be quite strong as it can enable minions to reach places unexpectedly. And I mean, maybe it shouldn't be that unexpected. There are so many ways in sorcery of giving uh, units extra movement. But, um, you know, generally speaking, the flying part is what excites me and making units um, able to do things in spaces that they, they couldn't usually go in. Or there are cards like um, Mountain Pass, where if there's a minion in the Mountain Pass, I think only airborne, like, airborne minions can go there, or no other minion can stop there, so it might be that this card lets you go past it. Um, so, yeah, like, very interesting, and you know, it's, it's kind of like a relatively unique effect, so um, even if it's not, you know, obviously awesome somewhere now, it will probably be obviously awesome somewhere later. 
All right, the elite here is Panorama Manticore. Five mana, five power, airborne, lethal. And at the end of your turn, if you cast a non-fire spell this turn, untap the Panorama Manticore. So I love this card for a variety of reasons. Um, five power makes it bigger than almost anything that people play in the early game. And um, there are a lot of four power things that I think are great because they're, about, they're bigger than the three things. Like five is just a sweet number. Um, most airborne creatures don't get to have as much power as their mana cost. This one does, so it's particularly powerful for an airborne creature. And it can fight other airborne creatures and often win. Um, it didn't really need lethal, like it's already got five power. Um, and I think that from a design perspective, it's not paying a lot in terms of like threshold or mana cost to have lethal because its power is so high. But there are a few things that have more than five power, and the you know lethal tag is not unwelcome. And then I like that this um, this card encourages a multicolor strategy. And um, you know when I look at building you know mid range decks that I often are like air fire and maybe something else. Uh, this card is, you know, gets a little more powerful because the ability to, like, move and attack and then untap to defend um, is just, you know, be better than not. So, um, I think this card's cool. Uh, I think it's very playable, and, um, you know, I, I would feel good about collecting this card. Um, Belmont Longbowman, I think we've talked about. I think this is just a bunch of ordinary cards in the rest of the pack, and uh, nothing shiny, so onward we go. Okay, so Peregrine Apparition, can't remember if we've talked about this, but um, three mana, one power. Airborne, Voidwalk, movement plus three. So it can kind of go anywhere um, really quickly. And the question is, what do you want to transport anywhere? Um, you know, I've seen people stick a devil's egg on this. Um, you know, I still think devil's egg is like silly and inefficient, but um, if you needed something to transport a devil's egg, this seems fine. Um, there's also like a Armageddon bomb or something like that where you know, it explodes for 20 damage in whatever space it got dropped off on. So um, I've seen this used as the like delivery creature for that, um, which is like kind of interesting. Um, but I think like there are plenty of other creatures with enough mobility to do that job. Um, the thing that interests me the most about this card is actually that it's a spirit. I think that there are, you know, a few cards that have spirit synergies, like the pirate uh, phantom ship, where whenever it exits the void, it um, you can summon a spirit, or um, you know, the like evil presence. I think lets you uh, give spirits haste. Obviously, this only has one power, so or you know, charge. Um, so it attacking on its first turn isn't that interesting, but Maybe there's something else interesting that it does. Um, maybe, you know, it's a good candidate for some kind of equipment. Um, and then, you know, I think, like, the Void Walk can be interesting, too. There's, like, a Lord of the Void or something like that. No, that's not Lord of the Void. There's some um, Void Horror creature that all your dead Void creatures come back, so that's kind of interesting, too. In general, I don't think this card has enough power... Uh, to be useful, so it, it's really um, some kind of combo engine, and you need something interesting for it to pay off. Um, like a land deed, you could put the, the car that you control the site that it flies over, and maybe do something dirty, like you know, turn one, play a Aquamarine Core, turn two, you play this, turn three, you play like a mix, and then... 
a deed and maybe your opponent is only gone twice so you fly over and have a land deed on half their lands but it, it's such like a magical Christmas land because like what's the chance that they can't do anything about that um, seems low um, so you know I uh, can't see it right now maybe if there's cooler things to fly around later uh, it could be cool um, next is the Brobding Nag Bullfrog Brobdingnag. Yeah, sure. Uh, when it enters play, uh, it swallows another minion, and then it stays swallowed and disabled uh, until it leaves the realm. Uh, obviously, like keeping the frog alive is challenging, but um, you know, if you do, it's a uh, temporarily take something away from your opponent, which you know, even sometimes if you're just buying yourself a couple turns of not being attacked by something big, uh, that can be totally worth it. So, you know, I think this card is probably, like, constructed worthy and, you know, cer certainly a thing that to play in limited where it might be like, harder to remove the frog. Uh, Outback Strider. Uh, this card doesn't excite me at all. Um... You know, it has free movement between unoccupied land sites, so it doesn't really do anything on water, and usually the sites you care about are the ones that are occupied. And, um, you know, maybe if you're, like, some aggressive fire deck, the ability to move into unoccupied sites and drain them might be great, and... Like, basically, I don't know if there's, like, a hit-and-run, air-and-fire, like, aggro deck, and if there is, this might be for it, but I really don't see it anywhere else. Um, my elite for this pack is Far East Assassin. So, uh, two mana, two power, uh, stealth, which, um, I think stealth is, like, an interesting effect in that if you, you know, like, your creature might live, uh, you know, to subsequent turns to do something fancy. Uh, tap, it throws an artifact, it carries a target adjacent unit, it, and then it takes damage equal to the artifact's mana cost. I'm not clear whether this counts as the Far East Assassin dealing damage, because it doesn't say that the Far East Assassin is striking it or dealing it. It uses the passive voice it takes damage, like the target takes damage. So I think I really need a rules clarification to understand, like, if this thing can just be like hidden and throw artifacts, uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I could get into playing some, you know, I mean, more expensive like equipment, like flaming swords or like crown of the victor, which like, you know, are good for pumping up my guys, but I mean, maybe throwing them at your opponent so that your opponent can then equip them isn't the best plan. Um, maybe there's other, like, other things that cost more than one mana that might be good. Um, or, but even just, like, throwing, um, like, one mana, um, like, ham like, the hammer thing that, like, comes back to your hand is kind of interesting. Like, recurring range damage, if it, like, stays stealthy while it's doing that. If it doesn't stay stealthy, not that exciting, but if it does stay stealthy, maybe, maybe there's some interesting things that you can do with this. Um, all right, let's see. Anything else in the pack worthwhile? Um, no. I think this is just where I'll, I'll leave us on this spin attack and say um, I continue to be more impressed by cards that uh, give strikes. And even though fire has a bunch of tools for doing area damage, um, sometimes minions have interesting carry-on effects with their strikes, so it could be worthwhile. Um, that said, you know, in all my experiments with Men of Lang, I have not quite dipped into spin attacks, so um, not the greatest. Uh, next pack, there's a uh, Tragedy Worrywart, which 
which I think is a very interesting card. Um, I think that from a metagame perspective, I think that fire spells that do area damage are kind of the most obvious and powerful thing that you can do in sorcery. Like, if, if your opponent is playing in a vanilla way where they're like, I have some creatures and some spells, um, the ability to cast something like Fireball or Cone of Fire and kill their creature and also damage the player uh, is just a very powerful effect. Like, um... Because, like, these fire spells... Like, if you play Berry and your opponent doesn't play any creatures that can be buried, your Berry does nothing. But if you play Minor Explosion or, you know, Fireball, even if your opponent plays no creatures, um, or no creatures that can be affected by a Fireball, you can still damage your opponent. Um, and, you know, I think that the deck that won the first tournament at Gen Con was, like, pretty burn heavy. So given that that is maybe like the level zero metagame of sorcery, Tragedy Worry Ward occupies a very special space, which is all of these spells that are like super powerful um, get turned off. And a lot of these decks that have fire and lightning spells as their removal don't have other removal. Um, so the fact that this is exceptional means that you can have up to three copies in your deck, like you can build a strategy around it. It's also a mortal, um, so there is a tutor in Earth Magic that can look for exceptional mortals. Uh, so like your ability to find Tragedy Worry, worry Ward is very high if you want it. Um, and it can also be part of a toolbox where you know you just have one and a tutor that goes and finds it. Um, I think. This is, um, yeah, strong recommend if you're like trying to figure out what cards are going to be good over the long term. Uh, this feels like a, a metagame centerpiece, and um, yeah, like happy, happy every time I I see one. Um, okay, the elite for this is Drums of Doom. Uh, five mana. Damage dealt to minions nearby is lethal. So, uh, this is interesting. Like, if you have a bunch of low power minions, um, that can, you know, kill someone's higher power minions. So, this kind of, like, leans more towards a swarm strategy. It also makes spells like Firebolt, where it shoots three Firebolts. Uh, possibly able to kill three big minions. Um, you're probably dead if there's three big minions, so maybe that's kind of like a pipe dream. But um, I think this card is pretty interesting. I guess if the assassin can throw things and not lose stealth, um, you know, being able to throw uh, a drum <laughs> for like five damage sounds uh, really painful and uh, kind of sweet. So. Um, and I guess also your assassin could, uh, in a flavor fail, have this drum and play it and then like throw some one mana thing and kill nearby minions. So um, I think it's also pretty interesting with uh, any card that moves minions and makes them strike or uh, with ranged units that get to strike but don't get struck back. Um, yeah, this is like very inviting with a bunch of like build around strategies, but it feels like it's mostly good when other players are playing bigger creatures and you're trying to make your smaller creatures better. So if in some future there's like sideboarding, I could see it being like a really good sideboard card. Um, or just if you're in like a metagame where there's a lot of big creatures and you're playing smaller ones. Um, this could be interesting. Feels really good in Earth, like, you know, where if you play, like, a full set of villages, if you summon up to, like, 12 soldiers, or you play, like, Border Militia, and you just have a lot of 1-1s, one and, you know, it allows you to trade. So, yeah, I, I think this is a cool card. 
Um, what else we got in this pack? All right, nothing shiny, and I think at this point we must have seen all the ordinary cards. Maybe I'll get surprised, but. Um, all right, so at this point, the pack construction is three extraordinaries, one either elite or unique, and then ten ordinaries and a sight in the back. I don't know if the sight is also always ordinary. I think it is. Um, all right, so we got another copy of uh, Tragedy Worry Ward, which is great. Happy to build up towards my playset. Um, shield Wall, three mana, Earth. I guess I should put this where you can see it too, instead of just reading to you. Also, I love the art on this. I you know, like love medieval knights and um, kind of like spent a lot of time like gazing at art about England and you know Vikings and um, you know. France and just the coloration in this is like spot on for all of those like illustrated books I, I read and uh, this card just makes me feel so nostalgic for my youth. So uh, I guess Andrea or Andrea um, you know, killed it on this one in my opinion. Um, so until your next turn each ally takes one less damage for each other ally that's nearby. Uh, if you have any number of, you know, any kind of like swarmy thing, uh, this is pretty much saying until your next turn, none of your allies take any damage. This lets small creatures team up against big creatures. Um, this lets, you know, things fight, things with lethal without dying. Um, you know, I'm not sure that it, in an Earth deck, I would like, you know, pop in three copies, even if I was being super swarmy. Like, I might like having Shield Maidens better, but um, it's the sort of thing where I could see having, you know, a copy or two for like, you know, like strategic, interesting moments. It's probably more of a limited card than a constructed card, where, um, you know, like, Targeted removal is desirable, but uh, like a card like this that just ruins combat math for your opponent is sometimes the next best thing. Sometimes it's even better. Um, this is just like a very strong effect in a game where people can build up creatures over time. And I think in Constructed there's too much like area removal and like sweepers, but in Limited um, those cards are... Um, generally in the higher rarities, so you're just not going to see as many of them in games. Um, Alright. And then I have another card we haven't talked about yet, and I really, I think about this card a lot. Uh, Sarwayan Hydra. Six mana for six power, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an acceptable place on the power curve from my perspective. Uh, but then it's immune to non-lethal damage. So unless it has the word lethal, uh, it's just not going to kill this creature, which is both great against other creatures, uh, but there are also lots of cards that um, you know, it just doesn't care about. So like, you know, I mean, Fireball only deals four damage, but it also doesn't care about Fireballs. Um, it can be reading a panoptic Tome, and it doesn't matter how expensive the card is because it ignores the damage from the panacoptic tome or however that's pronounced. Um, so, like, I just, like, I think that six power for six mana is a great rate. And um, I think that, once again, we're talking about this metagame where it's very damage focused. And uh, I feel like these hydras are a foil for that metagame. And it is often the case that um, if there's a dominant metagame established where something is clearly powerful uh, and a lot of people are playing it, playing cards that are strong against that um, can make you just very well positioned. And so I think that this card will kind of timelessly be well positioned 
both because like its size is good and its ability is just a very strong one. And you know, from a design perspective, I like that this card kind of captures the essence of being a Hydra. And um, you know, I think like the art is good, and also because the um, you know most of the burn spells are in fire, like it being a water card, so it's kind of like a hoser for fire in a more subtle way. Uh, feels right. So big fan of that one. And then um, I'm going to take a second to just talk about Tufted Turtles. I think that when I talked about them before, uh, I might not have given them their full due. Uh, you know, the more I think about the metagame, I still wish these had like three power, but they might have been too good if they had three power. I kind of wish that they cost two mana, and maybe they would have been too good if they cost two mana, then maybe they would have been better, who knows. Anyway, they cost what they cost, but um, I think that in a damage-heavy metagame, I think that these guys are also... Everything they said about the Hydra is less true, but still kind of true about these turtles. Um, Alright. Next pack... So, um, Mariner's Curse is a card that I don't think we've talked about, so I'll throw this down here. Uh, three mana, it's an aura. Whenever a minion enters an affected water site, submerge it and return Mariner's Curse to its owner's hand. So, you know, this is a very versatile card, and the fact that it can be reused over and over um, I think it makes it particularly powerful. Like, I think this is almost a, like, must-play in any water strategy. And, um, you know, when combined with things like uh, Riptide or Harpooners that have, like, forced movement into the water, you can, you know, kill creatures. So... Even though I keep on talking about the fairy land where I make things fly over a um, bottomless pit, maybe that's just the wrong approach because, like, Mariner's Curse just does it better. Uh, this also combines really well with uh, enchantments like Flood, which make a bunch of spaces, also water spaces, or Flood Plains, so that um, you can really kind of, like, stretch the reach of Mariner's Curse. Um, and if... If water is ever like somewhat dominant in the metagame, um, the like the reason people will start playing like dispel or disenchant or unravel will be to deal with probably this card specifically, as well as um, Atlantean Fate. So um, yeah, I think this is just like a fantastic card, and um, you know, it's it's one of those ones where I'd, I'd I'd probably collect it because it's just one of those staples for the game, as far as I understand it. Uh, okay, so... So my elite here is Unlikely Alliance. Um, this is this can be a very powerful card drawing effect. I draw a card for each rarity among allied minions. Um, minions get killed a lot, so it's not as... Um, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, this is just like a pretty easy draw three or draw four. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly have board states where I often have two minions. And I think that spending four mana for two cards is acceptable. Um, you know, I'd want to really construct my deck so that it had a nice mix of rarities so that I had a better chance of drawing three or drawing four. Um, but I, you know, I think this is a pretty solid card. Um, you know, I think if you've watched my other videos, you might have heard me, like, question Grandmaster Druid, where I, like, or Wizard, where I'm like, I'm not sure that I want to play six mana to draw three cards. But, um, I think that, you know, spending four mana to draw two cards, even though it's the same ratio, uh, is a little better in my mind, because... The turns that you have four mana on, the game is still often, can be pretty early 
and people are still setting up and like you're not like I need to do something big or I'm dead ASAP. So I think that, um, you know, this is more, a little more flexible and then it also, it just has, you know, more upside, like the fact that you could draw three or four cards, um, means that it can have an exceptional rate. And um, so anyway, I, I like this card, um, and I don't, even when I'm playing air, I don't always play it because uh, it has some serious like deck building considerations to make it awesome. Um, but if I, um, yeah, like I think particularly in like an air only deck or um, if I wasn't playing with fire where, you know, like wayfaring pilgrims tend to be the draw strategy I want to lean into. Um, you know, I, I can really see it in a like air and earth deck where like earth is very creature focused or air and water deck where um, water has some like great role playing creatures that are at the higher rarities. So yeah, um, I think very good card. Um, then like looking through the rest of this pack, it looks like it's uh Ordinary things that are not shiny, so clear some space in the box to put more cards in. Throw these over off screen and open another pack. Okay, so another changeling, another werewolf, flood flame, uh, the elite for this pack is Sky Baron. So, um, yeah, I think six mana for six power is great. You know, Airborne makes it very hard for your opponent to, like, gang up multiple creatures. Um, you know, six power is out of the range of a lot of burn spells. So, um, you know, there's some spells, but not a ton that, like, take this thing down. But like I think six is also uh, an amount of mana that you can ramp up to, particularly if you're a Pathfinder, which you probably know I'm biased towards. But um, even even as other types of casters, I think you can get up to six in a reasonable time frame that this is like a playable card. Um, and then like making other minions lose airborne um, can catch people off guard, though. Yeah, I think that's not the main attraction. I think it's just like. There aren't that many, um, you know, this power for this rate in air, and yeah, I think that part's exciting. Oh, and I should say it's a spirit. So um, you know, combined with evil presence, you can make this thing go fast. Which um, getting hit for six out of the blue is um, pretty painful. And um, it also combines really well with the phantom ship. Like, if someone has killed this, which they probably wanted to, um, if you have a phantom ship and can, like, move it, you probably have enough mana to, like, bring this back. And, um, you know, this thing is powerful enough that it's going to, like, draw out someone's removal spells. And if you get to, like, follow up with a ship and bring it back, like, you could just kind of attrition them out. That's actually, that's pretty exciting. That might be a bag. It's exciting enough that that might be a deck that I try and build. Let's see. Um, Alright. Uh, next pack. Cave in. So, uh, I think I've opened this before, but... Um, I, I, I love this as a removal spell. Like, I think um, getting everything in the space is nice. Um, it is often the case that, like, someone might have their cores and or philosopher's stone and you know apprentice mages all in the same space because they're turtling up for defense and protecting their avatar and being able to just bury all of that um, at once is very efficient um, you know I think that this is a card that you have to worry is in any, any earth deck um, or that, like, someone might even splash, so if you just see, like, enough Earth Threshold, you know, you just kind of have to keep it in mind as a possibility. Um, alright, uh, the Elite here is Master Tracker. 
I don't love this card. Um, yeah, I'm always like, is it much better than Centown's? It's a little bit better. Um, I probably wanted some other elite. Um, like, I just think of there's like plenty of things that remove stealth and I'm not sure how concerned I was about stealth in the first place anyway. Uh, two mana for two power is like fine, but not really what I want in my aggressive decks. So unless stealth somehow becomes a lot bigger a problem than it currently is, like I'm not excited about this at all. Um, like maybe in the world where like sneak thief, like stealing cores is a huge part of the metagame, um, I might I might change my tune, but for now, I just I just don't see it like I'd rather just cover the ground in fire or, like, use an earthquake. Like, stealth just doesn't protect a thing enough, I think. Um, like, I tried playing some games with Fade and, you know, both got strained in my hand a bunch because, like, everything was just dead all the time. But even when I did it, um, you know, my opponents just always had something that made it so that the fact that my creature was stealthy didn't matter. Uh, great, so that's uh, one third of this booster box, and uh, I guess as usual I've talked an hour about 13 packs, so <laughs> I'm going to stop there and uh, I'll pick up with the rest of the booster box later. Take care.